Welcome to the Robotics for Infectious Diseases interview series. I'm Dr. Robin Murphy, the Raytheon Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at Texas A&M and a founder of the Center for Robot Assisted Search and Rescue. We have Dr. Gerald Parker, Associate Dean for Global One Health at the College of Veterinary and Medicine and Biomedical Sciences at Texas A&M. He's a doctor of veterinary medicine and holds a doctorate in psychology from Baylor College of Medicine. And before coming to Texas A&M, he was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Chemical and Biological Defense. And he was also one of the commanders for the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute for Infectious Diseases, U.S. Amaret. I like to think he was the inspiration for Brian Cranston's character in Contagion. Welcome, Jerry. Thank you for making time for us. Well, thank you for having me. Dr. Angela Clendenin will interview Jerry. Angela is an instructional assistant professor of epidemiology and biostatistics at Texas A&M School of Public Health. Angela has been working for the past two years on how to integrate robots into emergency medical response, including an interesting telemedicine experiment with trapped victims, simulated of course, at the School of Public Health's Disaster Day at Disaster City. Welcome, Angela, and please take it away. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Dr. Parker, thank you for joining us. Um, obviously, I think one of the big questions that uh, people would like to understand, and I know it's a challenging question to ask, but in your words, what is public health? Well, I, um, I, I think about public health uh, is keeping uh, all of us all of us safe and, and healthy and and, and often public health also um, has to uh, make sure that the most vulnerable in our society are, are um, uh, providing access to, to healthy, uh, healthy information and healthy lifestyles. But public health preparedness is where I've spent a lot of my career, uh, either in, um, in the research or when I was at Health and Human Services, and even in DOD in charge of the Chemical and Biological Defense Program. It was public health preparedness and so uh, what that really uh, implies to me is how do we make sure that the public in fact is safe and secure from all hazards, uh, threats uh, to, our, to our health, our health security. And then, then uh, specifically, I focus a lot on emerging infectious diseases um, and in the past, whether that be um, anthrax from an intentional uh, attack or SARS-CoV or H5N1 uh, avian influenza or the 2009 H1N pandemic and, and so forth. So it's, I think about um, my, my particular focus in public health is, is keeping us safe and secure for all hazards threats that could threaten our health security. And I think COVID-19 that we're experiencing right now is, uh, well, unfortunately, it's um, maybe our biggest challenge that we've had to date in public health preparedness. So I know people are familiar with um, terms like outbreak and epidemic and now they're hearing pandemic, and that harkens back to H1N1. What exactly does it take to qualify something as a pandemic? Well, a, a pandemic, actually, it's got, it, it really is a loose definition, um, but um, when we have a, um, an outbreak could lead to a, a, an epidemic, which is kind of regional in, in nature, but a pandemic is when you have uh, almost a global spread, maybe not quite global spread, but it's... Um, uh, many think of it um, as affecting at least uh, two continents, maybe three continents, but you have global spread. And the important thing that you're having human to human transmission and you're really having ex exponential growth of infections uh, in, in several different areas of, of the world. You know, and this, this uh, of course, we now are in a pandemic with COVID-19. Um, and, and before it became a pandemic, there was a uh, a declaration of a public health emergency of international concern. Uh, many felt, as I did, that it became a pandemic uh, long before the WHO declared a pandemic. So knowing what public health is and that we are in the middle of a pandemic, what are some of the roles that public health professionals play as part of responding to a pandemic? What does that look like? Well, I'll use my military background and, and, and public health professionals Public health are frontline soldiers and keeping us safe, and for our health security and and there the, the the public health um, uh, community, the public health enterprise across the nation, across the world, really are the frontline responders for this type of emergency and a pandemic. 
and that their, their job is just absolutely essential. Unfortunately, I think as a society, as a nation, we haven't invested enough in the public health frontline responders, um, but they're, they're the ones um, when we think about trying to contain a virus coming into, our, into the United States. It, it was the public health frontline um, responders that were trying to identify the first cases of COVID in the United States. Uh, isolating those cases, providing care and treatment as necessary, and important in doing the contact tracing to isolate those who may have been in contact with those, the, those infected cases to try to prevent and contain the spread of virus in our, our communities. You know, unfortunately, um, we we um, reached an inflection point with COVID-19 where we're beyond the containment phase because we just overwhelmed our ability to try to try to uh, do the isolation on a case-by-case -case basis and contact tracing. We have widespread community transmission now, so that just overwhelms our, our ability to do that. So um, so public health is our front line. We, in the future, we need to, uh, to um, um, have the political will to do more, much more investment in our public health front line responders, give them the tools that they need, um, uh, and, and give them new technologies to help them do their, their job more effectively. Um, and, and make sure we're investing in laboratory capacities that we can have also scalable, uh, very rapid um, scale up of lab um, capabilities and capacities for new viruses that are gonna come. So when we're looking at the response to COVID-19, we see a lot about the doctors and the nurses that are doing the hands-on patient care. So how is public health different from clinical medicine? Well, I think about, well, actually, um, Part of my educational background is, is, is a veterinarian also. And uh, so I think about herd health, you know, from using my veterinary background. And so um, public health is a lot like herd health, but for humans. So we're really population based. We're trying to do the most and the best for the entire population. Where healthcare medicine is, is very much um, individual patient centered um, interventions. And public health has got to focus on on the herd uh, uh, and the human species, and, and actually from a one health perspective, we have to focus on the herd, both humans, animals, and the environmental health and safety. So before we get on to some of the specific areas where robotics might make a big contribution to public health efforts, if somebody wanted to learn more about public health, is there a book or other resource that you're particularly fond of that you might recommend for them, kind of like a public health 101? Oh boy, there's just so much, there's just so much information. Um, but if you're interested in actually public health preparedness, pandemic preparedness, I would greatly recommend John Barry's 1918 Great Influenza book. Um, and you will learn a whole lot about uh, what happened over a century ago. Um, and to our society with, with, uh, during that uh, awful event uh, that was an influenza pandemic that uh, some estimates um, 50 to upwards of 100 million people lost their lives uh, during that great um, uh, pandemic. But you'll see stories in that the importance of public health was really at its infancy then and, and some of these issues we didn't even realize it was a virus at the time. So that would be a great place to begin to learn the implications and the importance of public health by, by John, John Barry's book. And of course, there's, there's a lot of information available on the CDC website um, that really gives you a lot of insights uh, uh, on, on public health. And then I think our School of Public Health at Texas A&M is also a great resource. Thank you. Um, so one of the areas where people have mentioned potential robotics helping to automate some systems and pandemic response is cleaning and disinfection. Um, so what are some of the challenges and maybe some of the benefits of that particular role for robotics like the Xenox, Xenox UV germ zapping robots? Well, um, let me, um, I think actually, uh, as we move beyond right now in COVID-19, uh, we are in the mitigation phase, clearly in the mitigation phase. And we will get down to a point where we can go back. The case numbers are going to, we're going to get on the other side of the curve at some point. I can't tell you when, uh, but we will be on the other side of the curve. And we're going to go into another phase, what I call phase, phase three, which would be containment before we have a vaccine. And we're going to have to really leverage technology capabilities uh, to be able to get back to where we can do case-based um, identification of new infected cases, 
uh, isolation, contact tracing. So there's going to be a lot of technology applications there. But one thing that I do see that's going to be really important, also the emphasize not only our personal hygiene, like we have done now, but we're going to have to do a lot more just in, I think, our environmental disinfection on a much more regular basis. You see pictures in China and other countries where um, um, disinfecting, um, you know, say, subway, metro uh, uh, transportation type vehicles and, and airplanes. Um, we're going to have to do that a lot more after we get beyond the, the, the mitigation phase. And I think that's going to be a, a, a um, one one great place where robotics will play a, a, a key role. But I, I can envision there's going to be needs for robotics and also helping just that frontline public health responder. I, I, don't, I don't know the exact answer, exactly how they will be applied, but that's where I hope the roboticists that are listening to this can think about how, how technology can be leveraged once we get to this next phase in, in containment before we have a vaccine because it's gonna take a lot of laboratory testing, much greater enhanced laboratory testing than we have today. We've been successful in the last month ramping that up, but we have to have more population-based antibody tests, and that's gonna take, I think, robotics to help in that, but I think it's gonna also, there's, there, there's ways to help and leverage the frontline public health um, community as well, because we're gonna to have to increase our manpower on the frontline, but I think there's some technology solutions that robotics and artificial intelligence can be a big assist. So what about like they're using in Times Square in New York City where they're using robots to disseminate information or in China where they've used them for enforcement of quarantines? Do you see some pros and cons of using robotics in, that, in those capacities? Um, I, I definitely see uh, a lot of application for robotics and in, in making sure that we can help disseminate um, uh, information. In fact, maybe helping control using this forms of, of, um, of artificial intelligence as well to combat what I call infodemics. We are in a pandemic, but we also suffer from an infodemic as well with so much misinformation. And so I think that's where I think artificial intelligence, you know, coupled with robotics can, can be a dissemination of authoritative information and actually counter the misinformation that's coming from all directions as, as well. Enforcement quarantines, I have to think about that a little bit more, but I think there's a way to do it because we have to, you know, worry about the privacy concerns and and, and other ethical and societal issues that, that would be kind of a foreign concept for our community and not really accepted. But I do think there's a, a, a place for, for artificial intelligence, uh, information technology and robotics um, to perhaps help us in, 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 in spotting where disease hotspots may be. Uh, spotting where um, uh, large crowds may be gathering that uh, could lead to a hot spot, and how can, how can that how can that be used with de-identified information, so that we can try to prevent um, disease hot spots from, from from catching on. So one last question, you know, we've we've talked about some interesting ways that robotics might be able to help contribute to pandemic response and preparedness in the future. But if you had to prioritize them, what would you say the greatest need robots could address in a pandemic would be? Oh, that's a tough question because I think there's many, many er areas uh, that robotics are going to be absolutely essential as we, as we uh, get get beyond. I think this current crisis and think about the application of robotics as we go to the, the last phase of this, which is pandemic preparedness as a national security issue, and that's where I think we're going to have to let our imagination really open up of how we can leverage technology, robotics, and artificial intelligence in fundamentally new ways as we, as we move into a, a, a period that I hope we'll be taking and, and giving it the political will that it demands for preparedness as a national security imperative. And that, that's where I think we all need to just um, open our minds to the applications and the possibilities for the application of robotics. Okay. Well, thank you very much for sharing some time with us today and your views on robotics. Robin? Yes, Jerry, thank you so much. And I'm sure we all have great ideas and we'll try to apply them for this next round of, of pandemics of, of research to get ready for the next one. Thank well, you. Thank you very much. And thank you for your leadership and and trying to catalyze uh, the activities so that we will be, uh, we'll, we'll apply robotics for this one, but to be much better prepared for the next one. Thank you. 
So everyone, uh, do watch the Robotics for Infectious Diseases webpage for more interviews, reports, and other activities.